Good afternoon, everyone. And today is one of the most important days of the year. Today is Endangered Species Day. So very happy Endangered Species Day to you. My name is Jax. I'm going to be your naturalist down here at Penguin Beach today. We have Jason behind the camera and I cannot wait for this show. So what we're gonna do is we'll start our show off with some African penguins. Let's go have a look at them. And I am so excited to be down with you here today. This is a live show, so please do send us in your comments and questions using the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter or by going onto our channels page and submitting your, your comments there. If you are under the age of 18 and watching, please do send us an email at kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. And I would love to hear from you all today. I'd love to hear for you, from you um, what your favorite endangered species is, any suggestions that you have as to how to conserve these species. And today is a stunning day at Stony Point. So we had just a touch of rain over Hanspai earlier on, but it has now opened up and uh, Jason's just gonna give you a view of what we're seeing today. We have beautiful clouds, the ocean is blue. Let's go have a look at the weather report and see what they have to say. Degrees here. I think the sunshine is helping us out. And it really is a day that shows off the Overberg in her splendor. And we're very lucky to work in an environment this beautiful. I love working in the Overberg. I started my career in the Overberg and really fell in love with the ocean here in a way that I didn't actually think possible before I did it. And in my career, there's two endangered species that I have focused on and, and been involved with very, very much. And that is the African penguins that we watch um, and also great white sharks. So today we are gonna be talking about sharks. We'll be talking about lots of the endangered species that we do get in this area. Let's have a look at our, our penguins. We've got three in front of us who are waddling on. Ruth, I do love this waddle on, waddle ready story that we have going. Um, I think today is going to be a great one. And these penguins are waddling on back to the nests. So it's low tide here. And the African penguin is the most endangered species that we will show you on this show. The most recent count for African penguins is 10,000 breeding pairs. So we have lost about 90% of the entire African penguin population in the last 100 years. All Wild Earth explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. 
and have a look. Here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. Yeah, look at that. He's riding away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. Growing birds, they need to dig down into things to make their little... Homes. And so without the... Uh, Without the guano, it made it really hard for them to nest and really hard for them to protect their eggs and their chicks. So these penguins here have a little bit of help. There's the dune spinach, which helps to um, create spaces that they can burrow into to make their nests. We also put up artificial penguin houses. So these penguins are slowly making their way towards their homes. And today we, we help the penguins with these homes. So we give them artificial houses, we protect the areas where these penguins are breeding. But for many years, African penguins were actually not protected. There were millions of penguins around. Sinek, thank you for watching. And uh, I'm so glad to hear that penguins are your favorite endangered species. They are certainly a very charismatic species. And it's actually heartbreaking that an, an animal that is so beautiful and so clever actually um, has struggled so much. But we used to have millions of African penguins around and, and humans like to do that. When we see lots of anything, we like to think, oh, there's lots of this and we can do what we want because there's lots of it, it's never gonna go away. And uh, my, my family are originally from a town called Hansby, which is actually a town that we can see today. The, the sea is very clear. Uh, the mountains are very clear and in places that can't spy in fact around south africa um, for many years people would eat african penguin eggs and penguin eggs were considered a delicacy they were apparently absolutely delicious um, some of the old can't spires, as we call them will still tell you that they used to eat penguin eggs and we harvested millions of those eggs from penguins, once again thinking, you know, there's lots of these guys around. Far cry from what we see today, where we've just got a few waddling along the shoreline. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off. You get to watch their behavior and learn about the individuals. I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> if I could be any animal, I would be a cheetah. I would love to run fast. Our Western Cape coastline is graced with a Cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hout Bay Seal Rescue Center, seals in need are rescued, fed and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the center is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. Darkman Lover, thank you so much for joining and thank you so much for asking that question. Are great white sharks endangered? 
Now, great white sharks are in big trouble. It is very difficult to get a worldwide population on great white sharks. Um, and it is something that scientists who work with white sharks work on every single day. And Darkly Love, I'm very happy to tell you that as we stand here in the sunshine right now, um, two of my friends who are great white shark scientists are out at sea and they're doing everything that they can to find out more about these sharks and try to find ways to protect them. Um, but great white shark numbers have plummeted. In South Africa, we have less than a thousand great white sharks in our population. Um, the numbers could be lower than that. And the big problem with great white sharks is that they are very slow to breed. Um, so it takes them 20 to 30 years to reach breeding age. Um, great white sharks are also what we call a pelagic shark species. So Nadine, our director, and I were talking about it before the show. Great white sharks can travel to Australia. They undertake these massive migrations. Every shark undertakes a different migration. And so it's very hard to protect an animal species that is constantly on the move. And they are protected in South Africa, and we were, in fact, the first country in the world to protect the great white shark. But as soon as they cross the border to Mozambique, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, um, they are at risk of things like shark finning. But so much is being done. Um, I have friends who are working on, on papers proving that these sharks are struggling um, and trying to actually inform worldwide policy to protect great white sharks as a species. Um, and that would hopefully be within the entire ocean and not just country by country. It's very difficult to protect and regulate the open ocean. But often where these sharks are running into big trouble is actually on the shoreline because that's where they're interacting with people. So stopping shark exports is a very big thing uh, that is being done. And as much as we're talking about endangered species today, what I really would love to talk about is, uh, is what you guys can do. Because what stands between any animal and extinction are people who care enough to do something about it. And so just by signing some of those petitions that say stop shark finning and also um, you know, stop the import of shark, you can help these animals. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the southern hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. So we are, are trying to have a look at Khanspai and from where I'm standing, Khanspai is at 12 o'clock. It's the very last mountain that we can see almost going into the ocean. And that used to be the great white shark capital of the world. You used to be able to see great white sharks in Khanspai all year round. Khanspai is also a stronghold for the African penguin. We have Dyer Island there. And a lot of the penguins that we show you here at Stony Point are what we call deflectors that moved from Dyer Island. Ruth, so that's a really good question. I've actually been super lucky to work with many. Um, so I've worked with the endangered hawksbill turtle. I've worked with the Seychelles magpie robin, which was once the most endangered bird species in the world. I've worked with great white sharks. I've worked with the endangered humpback dolphin. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Southern right whales are not endangered at the moment, but they, they do struggle sometimes. Um, 
and are actually struggling a little bit at the moment, although not endangered yet. Um, I'm trying to think what else. African penguins, Cape cormorants, bank cormorants. So my, my passion around guiding is actually talking about the animals that we see, the threats that they face, but also the amazing work that's being done because I've been so lucky in my career to work with extremely passionate scientists and conservationists who every single day, as we stand here at Penguin Beach, um, as the guys are in Juma, um, as we are talking to you, there's this incredible work being done on all of these animals that we watch and love. And what I love about guiding is actually being able to communicate that with you guys and tell you about what's being done. Because I think it's very easy to feel hopeless. It's very easy to fall into things like eco-depression. And there are days where I get really sad about things. Um, but then I look at what's being done and there are so many success stories when it comes to wildlife and what we've done and how we've brought species literally back from the brink by just protecting them. We've got one penguin who's on a mission in front of us. He's doing a really fast little waddle. And I think Jason's found three, three more penguins who've just come back in from sea. Find a way into, into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also going to be told off. You see, it's, lions are not great at sharing their frustration out on the other lion but you see it was interesting in the woodlands of Juma lives a lion pride with a taste for buffalo look 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 this is insane now, this is what I was saying about lions and buffalo it's absolute pandemonium wild earth have been privileged to follow the Nkuhuma pride for many years one of the most loved cats in the pride is amber eyes she was not successful in rearing her first two litter of cubs and was seen as an aunt to the other youngsters. Then eventually, towards the end of August 2019, we found her with four tiny cubs of her own. So with all of these endangered species that we are watching, you have scientists who wake up every day and they're figuring out how to help them. So I was just mentioning those, uh, those penguin weighing stations and how they want to use those weighing stations to actually help better manage this penguin colony. No animal that I can think of that really shocked me. I think often when we see birds in abundance, like I, I always say to people, um, particularly when you see those big flocks of Cape cormorants, um, people think that you're a bit mad when you say they're endangered or um, sometimes if you see, you know, eight great white sharks on, a, on an expedition, people think you're a bit funny. Um, but nothing, nothing really shocks me because populations sometimes have these massive drops uh, really quickly. And sometimes you can see, see a lot of an animal, but what you're looking at is actually the stronghold of that entire species. Um, I, I was very sad to learn when the Cape Gannet became endangered a few years ago because that is my favorite seabird. So that made me really sad. And it does shock me how quickly the penguins are dropping in numbers. But to me, that is just all the more reason for all of us to take whatever steps we can to help protect these penguins. One of the best things that you can do from home is uh, you can support science because historically, science is really underfunded. Um, so these scientists that are going out and studying these birds need just a bit of help so that the studies can continue. Because the best way to protect endangered species is to study them, to understand them, 
and then to use those studies to inform policy. So those are the laws that help protect the animals that we watch. And if you are under the age of 18, if you're young and you are trying to figure out what you want to do with your life and how are you going to help the animals, the answer is that everybody has a special gift to offer wildlife and to offer conservation. And you've got to figure out what you're really good at and then you've got to do that for the animals. So some people are really good at maths and then you could become a data scientist. Some people are really good at art and you could draw artworks that made people care. They can do. If you're in your 20s and trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life, you can green your pension and make sure that your pension fund is something that is contributing to protecting the planet. And these penguins have no idea that it's Endangered Species Day. They are carrying on, not knowing they're, that they're the stars of the show. Thank you, Dark Man Lover. I really enjoy being able to chat about it. I really get a lot of fire from sharing this knowledge and being able to, to tell people about what we see because to me, this is the most stunning ecosystem in the world. I haven't seen the whole world, um, but I'm not sure that I could ever love any other ecosystem the way that I love the area that I work in at the moment. And I hope that it makes you guys love it too. I hope that you enjoy watching this every day and, and becoming involved in it. I think we're gonna leave these penguins to carry on preening. And I think let's go have a look at Cormorant Cove because we've got a couple of endangered species hanging out there. So we have two endangered cormorant species that breed there. We've got our bank cormorants and we have our Cape cormorants who are not around I think they're relaxing on the, on the rocks at the moment. They're not breeding. And uh, the Cape Cormorants are endangered for much the same reason as your African penguins, your Brutus whale, um, your Cape gannets. It all comes down to the fact that at the moment, there's just not enough fish to go around for all of the different animals that we have here. These Cape cormorants move between here, they go to Dyer Island, they sometimes rest on the mainland and other areas. Arctic Circle, that's a brilliant question. So you're asking if the African black oyster catch is still endangered, and the answer is no. And the reason for that, there's actually a couple. Um, one of the, the sort of weirdly exciting things that happened is that when these um, oyster catchers were so endangered, they had the alien mussels come to South Africa and provide a lot of food. Um, but the other thing is something that we did as people. Um, in South Africa, they banned driving on beaches. And um, further than that, um, one of my great mentors um, was involved in a study where they looked at people on beaches and how dogs um, would sometimes scare the oyster catchers off the nest. And incredible work was done to try to work with people living in areas where there were dogs and oyster catchers, um, to have areas where they didn't visit the nests, which has really helped increase breeding success. Us not driving on beaches has meant that the breeding success has increased. And every story that I'm going to tell you about conservation today, the solution, what brought the animals back was the fact that people cared enough to change their behavior. And there were scientists who cared enough to understand what was happening. So oyster catchers are now no longer endangered. The areas they breed are protected. They have enough food. And so they are a conservation success story and there really are so many. If you have a look at Cormoran Cove again, you have the, uh, the whaling tower. So this was a whaling station and around the world we decimated whales. 
southern right whales are decimated to only 300 animals worldwide before we protected them. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. Oh, and have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. And look at that, he's riding away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. So I always look at Stony Point as a very amazing example of conservation, the history, but also the future, because historically this was a whaling station, but today this is an area that protects wildlife. And so we can look to the past and see what we've done wrong, but we can also look to the future and see all the things that we're able to do right and to create spaces where animals are protected and, and really thrive. You can see the cormorants at Cormorant Cove feel very safe there. If they felt threatened, they wouldn't be making their nests there. So this has become a sanctuary for the, uh, the cormorant species, all four that we get along the South African coastline, which I find pretty incredible. All of it just starts with one or two people deciding maybe it's good to protect this area or, you know, there's something really strange happening here. Let's have a look and actually try and get to the bottom of what's happening. Jay, are you having a look at uh, the Shelleys? So the Shelleys are hiding in between the kelp forest there. The Egyptian geese are absolutely not endangered. <laughs> they are a species that really made a success of themselves. They're happy to be anywhere. They really do colonize new areas all the time. In some areas of the world, kelp forests are endangered, but in South Africa, our kelp forests are expanding their range. So they're moving east. And inside these kelp forests, we have some really interesting animals that live. And uh, I did say, I did promise you guys that we were going to do some show and shell. And I think after we've had a nice look at the Shelleys, we're going to have a look at what we call some mermaid purses. So I'm going to sit on the floor to do this with you. Um, so along the South African coastline, and in fact, in other areas of the world, you have sharks that do not give live birth, they lay eggs. And in South Africa, we have several different species of shark that do this. And so if you have a look, I'm gonna show you some really strange things. So this is a shark egg. And this is the egg of what we call a skate, which is like a, a funny looking stingray. And these two, also shark eggs. So all of these were picked up on one beach. I had to walk quite far to find all of these different species. Um, but these are little sharks that live inside the ocean 
um, right where we are actually. They'll live inside the kelp forest. And there's this really cool project called Elmo that allows you to be a citizen science where you can actually help to identify these shark eggs. And that helps people study the shark populations um, living in, in the areas along the South African coastline. So if you have a look, we are gonna play a little bit of a game of match and see, see what we find. This one, this guy, ah, that's upside down. It's very embarrassing, sorry. <laughs> this guy is what we call a St. Joseph shark egg. So that is um, also known as a, an elephant fish or chimera, really strange looking little animal. And what I really like about the, um, the Elmo project is they actually tell you, so this, this shark is of least concern so their population is doing super well. The next one I have is the, uh, I think it's the biscuits gate, no, the twinites gate, this guy over here. So you can see it's got lots of fibrous material on it, which is one of the IDs for this biscuits gate. So I'm gonna put that guy over there. And then we also have this guy, and this is a shark that we see fairly commonly around. Um, so this is the pajama shark. So you can see, hopefully you can see how that matches there. But the pajama shark is actually a near threatened species in South Africa. Um, so they are really cute. They've got these black and white stripes that look like, uh, look like really cute little pajamas. And then we also have an egg that's much smaller than the pajama shark, and that is of the dark shy shark and the dark shy shark is of least concern. So when you walk along the South African coastline, you can pick up these eggs, you mention where you've picked them up and you submit your sighting. And then scientists can see how the shark populations are doing in that area, which is super, super cool. So sharks lay their eggs um, on, on kelp. So they've got these really twisty bits that will attach to kelp and they'll lay two eggs that will be attached to the kelp and what's incredible, I find, humans are pregnant for nine months. Sharks stay in the egg for eight months and develop fully until a perfectly formed baby shark will come out of this and out of these, uh, these little eggs, which I think is really, really awesome. So I also find shark eggs really cool. Um, we, we call them mermaids purses in South Africa. Um, so you can find them all along the South African coast, really. You find a lot more in the Cape because we've got these kelp forests. And what I do want to point out, I don't have a leopard cat shark egg. Um, this is what the leopard cat shark egg looks like. What I would like to point out is that um, with the leopard cat sharks, the information that we have on them is what we call data deficient. And that's a little bit stressful because it means that we actually have no idea how well these sharks are doing in the ocean. And that is all the more reason for us to be picking up these shark eggs, recording the sightings when we see these sharks on our scuba dives. And that is something that everyday people like you and me can do to really help understand sharks and help get a grip on what's going on with these shark populations. So if you have a look on the side here, you can see Elmo. So Elmo is completely free to use. It's citizen science, which means that they want everyday people to get involved. Elmo also tells you about how to handle a shark if you ever catch one by mistake uh, or by mistake. <laughs> and uh, you can also send photographs of the shark so you can ID the individual animals, which is really cool. And there's another program called Fin Spotter by Cape Rad that does the same. So you take a photograph of the top of the shark and then you're able to see which shark is which. But I think we're gonna go have a look at the ocean again and see, uh, see what the ocean is doing. My name is Tessa. I studied animals and insects, and I specialise in African vertebrate biodiversity. But first and foremost, I am a naturalist here at Wild Earth. What inspired me to become a naturalist was a combination of a childhood love and passion for wildlife from our family holidays, 
it just became this amazing passion and it ignited this fire that just would not go away. To me, the skills that a naturalist should have would be that passion, making sure that you know why you've got that passion and keeping it going no matter what. The determination to never give up because it's not the easiest place to be, but I can tell you in my experience, it's the best place to be with the biggest differences that you can make. If I could be any animal, I think I would be a leopard. To me, they're the perfect combination of elegance and power and determination and independence and yet, just so beautiful. Using that middle channel. So the middle channel is the easier way to leave the area, but uh, these penguins are now walking, walking over the rocks there. You don't always get to watch them leave and it's so easy to lose them when they are going out. This is really a safety's, safety and numbers game that they're playing here. So they'll hide in between the kelp forest so that if there are any seals around, the seals are not going to find them very easily or spot them very easily. Maxwell, that's a really good question. So the shark eggs um, will be attached to kelp, <coughs> sorry, when they are um, developing. And then after the little shark has hatched, um, then the egg case will wash to shore. It also sometimes happens when you have these really big seas um, that those eggs wash to shore with the kelp because the kelp becomes detached. So wherever you have big wash ups of kelp, in theory, you might be able to find them. I've had a really good look around Stony Point and I actually really struggle to find in this area, which I find fascinating. And then um, the St. Joseph shark egg, um, which was the other funny looking egg. Um, sorry, am I thinking of it? Is it the St. Joseph's? Oh, I'm thinking of the, um, the skate egg. No, Anna, and it's the St. Joseph egg, sorry, it's both. Um, they actually don't attach their eggs to, to kelp, what they do is they embed um, the eggs in the seabed. Um, so you'll find the St. Joseph shark where you have sandy bottoms and the skates will also have their egg or um, sort of lay the egg on a sandy bottom. So that will be on the seabed. And once again, once the little skate and the little shark um, have hatched, then um, there's no, no more purpose for the case. And so it'll become detached and eventually wash up on shore. So I just want to go back to that St. Joseph shark egg, actually, because the St. Joseph shark is not a real shark. We call it a St. Joseph shark, but that is a, um, it's a, it's a chimera. So it's a very ancient species um, of fish. And I'll actually see if I can find it in the book for you. I've got my, uh, my two oceans here. Um, so it's in the shark section. Very strange looking creature. go. Sorry, I'm going to have to move that now for you quickly, Jay. Um, and just see. Shark section. Yeah, so right, right over here. So 113.4. So they are an ancient species of fish. Go over there. 
and uh... I'm not gonna come too close because I know you got your babies and hello you old friend isn't she spectacular oh look this is too special she's such a fantastic mother look at that isn't that incredible has gone up slightly. In fact, it's gone up quite a lot. This elephant is now two meters from us. Okay, we might have to move here. No? Yes. Sorry, my friend, but you're about to push that onto the car. <laughs> you see how cross he was that we didn't want to watch him push the tree over. That's why we moved. <laughs> really slow breeders. Sharks are slow breeders. Whales, to a degree, are slow breeders. So any species that breeds very slowly is in danger of becoming endangered simply because they're just not breeding fast enough to compete with the pressures that humans put on these species. And so they're not replacing themselves. Um, So a lot of your oceanic species are not really replacing, replacing themselves at a rate that matches um, the amount of animals that are, are being taken out of the population. Let's go have a look at the penguins who are sitting on the shoreline to see what they're doing. I think we have another double-banded penguin. I think it might be one of the same ones we saw the other day. He's sitting on the shore. Emily, so that's a really good question. Um, so in the world, there are around 350 different species of shark. So definitely not. Um, the sharks that I'm talking about, all of these sharks, are, are what we call cat sharks or shy sharks. Um, so the ones that are laying eggs on kelp in South Africa are part of the cat or shy shark family. So it's one very similar family of sharks that do it. Um, so those are the sharks that lay eggs. A lot of sharks give live birth, um, so the eggs will develop inside the body. And then by the time the shark is ready to, to sort of have the baby, um, the babies come out live. So great white sharks give live birth. Never been recorded, nobody knows where it happens, but we know that they do it. Um, other shark species, your larger shark species will do the same. Um, so your blue sharks, your makos. Um, another common shark species we would get here is the bronze whaler shark. And so different sharks will do different things. Um, but your smaller sharks, your cat sharks, will uh, will give, or will lay eggs and not give live birth. And so all of the cat sharks that we in, see in South Africa, bar one species, the Natal cat shark, um, will have to find kelp or other seaweeds within a kelp forest to be able to lay their eggs. And I'm not sure I've actually shown you the the shy sharks on this uh, on this show. I'm not sure we've shown them in the book. Um, sorry, Jay, I'm going to do this to you again. <laughs> but let's go just have a look so you guys can actually see what these shy sharks look like. It's all sort of on the same page. So the shy sharks that we see here, um, that's the pajama shark. That that's the egg that we had. We also have the leopard cat shark. So we also have, we didn't have a leopard cat shark egg. Um, the puff adder shy shark is a very common species. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off. You get to watch their behavior and learn about it, the individuals. 
I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. Look at that. <laughs> If I could be any animal, I would be a cheetah. I would love to run fast. Our Western Cape coastline is graced with a Cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hald Bay Seal Rescue Center, seals in need are rescued, fed, and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the centre is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. So, you can see just on one page um, the cat sharks look all very similar. Um, the seven gill shark is a different species that also occurs here, one of the most ancient shark species in the world. Um, and it's just a few of the species that occur in South Africa. Um, the pajama shark is what we call an endemic species, so they only really occur here, which is really cool. But I think we're going to put the book down again and maybe go have a look at the kelp forest. Looks like we've got more birds who are heading out to fish, more penguins. We've got two more who look like they're heading out. So that's a great sign for us on Endangered Species Day. If penguins have picked up that there's fish somewhere out in the ocean. So it means that they might be able to find a bite to eat. And that is the, the one thing that's really threatening penguins at the moment is the lack of food. Um, and ways that we can help help them with that. Um, something that's really cool that actually got put into South African schools yesterday is by choosing to eat sustainable fish. And the way that you can check sustainable fish in South Africa is by going to the WWF SASI app. And you'll see that anchovy, which is what these, uh, these penguins eat, is an orange listed species, which means think twice about having it because um, it is a species that is struggling a little bit. Sardine are also really struggling. So just by choosing to not use products that have sardine or anchovies in them. And so many products do. Your dog food often has fish in it, um, fish meal for the gardens. Just by looking at that, you are are actually able to help these African penguins by not creating a demand for their food source. If you really want to help sharks, another thing you can do is try to make sure that none of your makeup or your um, supplements contain what we call squalene, which is a substance found in sharks. Jason's saying he's found Stanley. Sorry, Nature Hugger, I, I did hear your question. You're asking about endangered reptiles by the South African coastline. And I'm having a think. Nothing comes to the li I'm cheating because I think you're asking me about lizards, but I'm going to go for the leatherback turtle because <laughs> I believe that the leatherback turtle is an endangered species. Um, we don't see them along the coastline here, but they definitely go um, just a bit, bit out to sea. The water along the coast is cold, but then just past the water along the coast, there's this really nice warm patch of water, of ocean, that the turtles cruise through. Um, and there you'd have things like your leatherback turtles, your green turtles, um, and turtles in general not doing so well. Um, in Stony Point, I think that our agamas are doing well and the girdled lizards, I think their population is, is doing okay. But Nature Hugger, what I will do is I'll just go and check if there are any endemic species of reptile to the coast in terms of your lizards and your skinks and snakes and things like that, um, that are not turtles. And I will go and have a look for you. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner 
of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. For another themed day to, to come around again. So this little penguin is, uh, is not Stanley, but we're still going to watch this bird. Oh, where are you looking? Um, so, Jason is a genius because Jason has actually found us Pepper, and Pepper is sitting on the slipway. So Pepper is cleaning him or herself, that is unbelievably good luck. We were just literally just talking about Pepper. And you can just see by the face. Pepper doesn't have very much black on the face at all. If we're super lucky, maybe Pepper might turn around. Pepper likes to show up on the important days. Pepper's here on Earth Day. Pepper's here on Endangered Species Day. Pepper is what we call a, uh, an ambassador for the African penguin species. I really think Pepper knows it because Pepper always shows up when they should. <laughs> and I don't think anyone is more excited than Nadine, our director. We were saying this morning before the show, we were doing our show checks and uh, we've been talking about Pepper for a while. So super cool. I don't have no idea how Jason managed that. So Pepper is on the old whaling slipway. And Pepper's saying, you know what, we are endangered, but uh, we're still here and we will take back our wild spaces that were once used for whaling and for other human purposes, for guano scraping. And that is the great thing about endangered species and about nature is that when we let nature recover, nature does. And animals come back from incredibly no, low numbers. And that's all around the world with so many different species. Jamie, I think this is our gift for Endangered Species Day, is getting to see everybody's favorite penguin. We'll go, I'll go after the show quickly and see if I can get you guys a nice video um, and we'll put it on our Instagram stories probably um, so you guys can have a close look at Pepper because I don't think Pepper wants to show, show us their belly today. But that is super cool. Pepper is giving us a bit of a tail wag. Really hoping. I think we're going to stick with Pepper for a little bit just to see if Pepper might turn around for us. So Pepper does like the slipway. And I think the slipway is quite a nice place to sit if you're a penguin because there's no rocks. You're quite high above the water, so there's no chance of you being smashed, especially when the tide's low. Look 
at that, look at that. There's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy. We just came around the corner. That is incredible. That's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. I oh, have a look. Here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. And look at that. He's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. Tingana has been affectionately known as the Duke of Juma for many years, but his path to the throne was not an easy one. Mvula was a legend from the south. This is the cat that I'm pretty sure Tingana was sniffing around for. That is Mvula. How exciting is this? Eventually, Mvula lost, but his young son, Quarantine, started to push through from the east. At the beginning of 2018, an intruder arrived. His name was Hukumuri. We're still waiting for Pepper to see if Pepper might give us a good view of that beautiful spotty tummy. And speaking of spots, looks like that's what Cedric is hoping to find on today's drive. And they're also going to be chatting about endangered species on the, the Juma show. And um, before the show, Nadine and I were chatting about how you know, it's so different bush to bush to sea because sea is an open system. Um, when you work at sea, you're sort of seeing endangered species and, and seeing the causes and the reasons every day. But in the bush, we are so lucky that we're able to put fences around the animals and protect them within the confines of, of the fences. And uh, Chris is going to be enjoying a bush walk where he's going to look for some endangered things. Liam is going to be sitting at Dam Cam and really hoping that he might get to spot something cool there this afternoon. Ah, Pippa is moving. Jason is my eyes. Where is Pippa moving? It was already 